thank you very much indeed for that very generous introduction, Alan. Um, I slightly felt my, my uh, past swimming before my eyes there, actually. I, <laughs> I hope that doesn't, I hope that, uh, doesn't mean it's uh, coming to an end. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for inviting me here this evening. I feel slightly as though um, I'm walking into the lion's den because um, explaining um, a system that, uh, that, 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 that exists in uh, south of the border in England, Wales, that's a mere um, 17 years old now, uh, when you have here uh, a doctrine of treasure trove and bona vacantia, which goes back, what, more than 160 years at least, and, and probably longer than that. Um, I suppose my one, um, one thing I can say, my, uh, my defense in talking about the um, English regime is that um, the current legislation that we have, the Treasure Act, was introduced into Parliament by a Scottish peer, the Earl of Perth. So. <laughs> um, when the news of the discovery of this hoard of Anglo-Saxon gold, um, the Staffordshire hoard, uh, in a field north of Birmingham was announced in 2009, it caused a public sensation. And I dare say many people in this room may recall that. Um, and here's some of the publicity which accompanied the announcement. Um, as archaeologists, we winced at its concentration on gold and commercial value. But there's no denying uh, the enormous public interest uh, that there was in that find. People queued for three hours to see it when it went on show for three weeks in Birmingham Museum immediately after the announcement of the discovery. And it seemed um, at one point that all the towns in the West Midlands saw it as the key to the regeneration of their area. Um, the um, image um, at the bottom left is from um, Tamworth Council proudly advertising their contribution to the effort to save the hoard. And the website um, that we built for the hoard at one stage was getting 2,000 hits per second, which is um, quite heavy traffic. Um, of course, the artifacts um, in, in the hoard were of the highest archaeological and historical interest. Um, there were over 1,800 objects in it, um, including over, uh, amounting to over five kilograms of gold. And it contained unique objects, such as um, this folded gold cross, um, which uh, we see uh, here on the, on the right, um, and a reconstruction drawing over on the left, if I can... Yes, so that's the reconstruction of that. Or we have um, this gold strip um, with its very evocative um, inscription taken from Psalm 68. Rise up, O Lord, and may thy enemies be scattered, and those that hate thee be driven from thy face. I think this was an early version of muscular Christianity, um, because that is actually, the uh, again, from a Christian cross. Nothing like these objects had ever been found before. The find um, was made by a metal detector user, um, this man here, Terry Herbert, uh, while detecting on a local farmer's land with permission. Over four days in July 2009, he found some 300 objects, and he took photographs of them all and recorded them carefully, and those are the photographs we see here. He reported them to um, his local finds liaison officer, um, I'll come back to that uh, term, who immediately um, came to um, the uh, uh, headquarters in British Museum for help. And we were able to arrange that one of the other members of our team, one of our find specialists, Dr. Kevin Leahy, uh, was able to carry out an initial assessment of the finds. Of course, the first priority was to organize the controlled excavation by archaeologists of the rest of the hoard. Um, and the county archaeologists attended the site the next day, that's them here, and started investigating. And you can see from this image just how incredibly near the surface um, some of the objects were. Um, <clears throat> the, local the, the local archaeology unit from Birmingham University was commissioned to carry out the excavation which had to be done in great secrecy, as it was an extraordinarily exposed location next to three major roads. This is the M6 here, 
This is the A5, another very busy road, and this is also um, a local main road as well. That's the fine spot um, in there. No stone was left unturned in ensuring that all the objects were recovered. A crack team of police experts who were more used to searching for enemy devices in Afghanistan were called into the search, and you see the sort of mini helicopter that they had as well to help them. Um, and the archaeologists did not refrain from doing their best to put local journalists off the scent when they started making inquiries uh, before we were ready to announce the fine. So team digging for clues on the Romans while they're still looking there for clues on the Romans. <laughs> um, the committee that had the role of recommending valuations for fines of treasure placed um, a figure of uh, 3.285 million pounds um, on the hoard. And here we see members of the uh, Treasure Valuation Committee um, examining it. That sum of money had to be raised by uh, the two museums that have jointly acquired it um, in Birmingham and Stoke-on-Trent. And many people at the time predicted that they would struggle to do it. In fact, such was the enormous public interest in the hoard that they were able to raise the money in record time. Um, in fact, the Art Fund, a charity that helps museums acquire objects, which led the fundraising experts, said they'd never before had so many contributions from individual members of the public in one of their campaigns. And um, you may recognize the features of David Starkey lending a hand to the appeal, or a local brewery jumping in on the act as well. The project to conserve and study the hoard um, is now in progress, and it is a long job. Um, the hoards featured, of course, frequently on television. Um, National Geographic made two programs about it, um, and they also hosted an exhibition of it in the United States. Um, and this uh, little booklet, published in 2009, so far sold over 35,000 copies, um, and a new edition will be published in May. So that was the story of one find um, where on the whole, things, things went well. It doesn't always happen that way. And here's another find where things have not had such an easy outcome. Um, this was um, a Roman helmet found um, at Crosby Garrett, um, not very far uh, from the border with Scotland in Cumbria, found by a metal detector user who again did report it to one of our fines liaison officers who was able to establish exactly where it was found. But in this case, um, he and the farmer had already decided uh, that this object, uh, they were going to sell this object at Christie's, who subsequently had it restored, and it sold for £2 million at auction in um, October 2010. The local museum in Carlisle, Tully House Museum, led a brilliant campaign to try and buy it, um, and succeeded in raising 1.8 million within space of four weeks, which was a remarkable achievement, but of course not quite enough. The helmet was bought by, bought by a private buyer in the United Kingdom, um, and we do not know who um, that person is. The problem uh, was that this helmet uh, was at, is outside the scope of the Treasure Act in England and Wales, um, and its sale um, has led many uh, to question um, the usefulness of that act. However, um, because it was reported to the local fines liaison officer, we did at least have a fine spot for it, and last spring it was possible to carry out, first of all, a geophysical survey around um, the fine spot, and subsequently a small excavation. And um, <clears throat> this at least proved that the object had come from Crosby Garrett. This is the, the trench where the helmet had been buried. Um, some people who commented on the web at the time had doubted that, um, and yeah, also that it had a context. Um, it seems to have come from a so-called native settlement. The immediate context of the helmet, I mean, you, uh, which you can see here, remains difficult to pin down. It seems to have been buried below a rough stone floor, although whether that belonged to a building, a road, or possibly um, a memorial cairn is not completely certain at the moment. Two coins from this trench um, are dated to the 330s AD, 
uh, which suggests that it had been kept for some time before it was placed in the ground, as the helmet probably dates uh, to more than 100 years before that time. For two years, the helmet disappeared from public view, but in 2012, it appeared in, at an exhibition at the Royal Academy, and it's now recently been on show at Tully House Museum in Carlisle, where 20,000 people have seen it. And from tomorrow, it will be on show at the British Museum for three months. At this point, I'd like to turn to the history of the legal protection for discovered antiquities um, in England and Wales to explain how it was that the Staffordshire Hoard received legal protection and the helmet did not. Until the law changed in 1996, the common law of treasure trove, uh, which applied in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, had not changed in any significant way since medieval times. Under this law, all gold and silver objects had to be reported to the coroner who took advice from the National Museum. So uh, the British Museum for Finds from England and the National Museum for Wales for Finds from Wales. To be treasure trove, a find um, had to pass three tests. It had to be made of gold or silver, had to have been buried by its original owner with the intention of subsequently coming back and recovering it, and its original owner or his or her heirs had to be unknown. Finds that were treasure trove were offered to museums to acquire, and they were valued at the full market value, and the money was paid to the finder as a reward. Um, and landowners um, uh, were not eligible. In the case of all other finds, the landowner generally had the best claim if he could show that he intended to exercise control over the land uh, where the find was made. In Scotland, on the other hand, the common law developed in a different direction. Um, <clears throat> uh, and um, from the 19th century onwards, the combination of the Scottish common law of treasure trove and the legal doctrine of bona vacantia means um, that, as I understand it, all ownerless objects are, in theory, the property of the crown, although, of course, um, it only lays uh, claim to the more important fines. The problems with the old English law of treasure trove um, were numerous. Only a small number of gold and silver objects um, qualified as treasure trove. As a result, many single finds um, of, of um, gold or silver objects were not reported. Uh, because um, their finders thought that uh, the objects were more likely to have been lost rather than deliberately placed in the ground. Votive deposits um, and burials were not eligible for the same reason, because um, they, they were not seen to have been deliberately buried in the ground with the intentional recovery. Um, and because um, only gold and silver objects qualified, even with a, a hoard like um, this, which is um, a Roman jeweler's hoard con ber uh, contained in this pot, which contained items of gold and silver jewelry, rings, uh, some of them with their gems still in them, and some of them where the gems had fallen out, and bronze and silver coins. Only the silver object and gold objects uh, were treasure trove, so those stones that have fallen out of the rings, the bronze coins and the pot were all not treasure trove and therefore had completely different ownership from the other objects. The helmet I show is from um, the great Anglo-Saxon burial at Sutton Hoo in Suffolk, um, excavated in 1939. A coroner's inquest was held on that and it was deemed not to be treasure trove because it was a burial. Um, in England, um, attempts to reform the law started in the 1850s, um, and in 1858, a peer uh, called Lord Talbot de Malahide introduced a bill into Parliament which was um, not successful. 28 years later, though, in 1886, the Treasury introduced um, a circular, so this was not legislation but an administrative act, establishing the principle of paying ex gratia rewards for fines of treasure trove that museums uh, wish to retain. Uh, when the Council of British Archaeology was founded uh, at the end of the Second World War in 1944, the reform of the law of treasure trove was one of its founding aims. 
And in the 1960s and 1970s, the Council of British Archaeology consulted on reform, culminating in a bill uh, that was introduced into Parliament, again by a member of the House of Lords, Lord Abinger, in 1981. However, that made no progress because it was not supported by the government. In the meantime, in the 1970s, we have the introduction of um, uh, cheaply available metal detecting, which uh, led to an enormous increase in fines and therefore made um, this whole issue very much more acute. And in 1977, um, the government introduced a committee, uh, an independent committee, which had the role of determining the valuation of fines that uh, museums wished to acquire called the Treasure Trove Reviewing Committee. Before that time, um, valuations had been recommended by the British Museum, and that was seen uh, to be, be a manifestly unfair way of uh, doing things. It actually took a disaster before um, a, there was another attempt, and, then, and this time ultimately successful, to reform the law. And this was um, the looting of um, a Romano Celtic temple site at uh, Wanborough in Surrey. Um, and this uh, led to the local archaeological society, the Surrey Archaeological Society, to start a campaign for reform. Here we see um, the site at Wanborough covered with holes dug by um, illicit uh, detectorists. Um, and these are some of the coins um, that they found uh, Iron Age coins very of a very unusual type, quite distinctive. The police recovered about a thousand coins in all from the hoard, but it's believed there were many more time, many more times as that were, that were not recovered, maybe as many as 9,000 in all. And the person who had um, the biggest group of coins um, was prosecuted, but that fell through, that failed, because the prosecution could not prove beyond re or reasonable doubt that the coins had be, been buried with the intention of recovery and thus were treasured trove. Um, an archaeologist gave um, evidence in uh, support of um, the, the man from whom those coins had been recovered to say that there was a, 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 a valid archaeological um, uh, interpretation that these were more likely to be been a votive deposit than a, a represent a burial with the intention of recovery. So this sent out a message that the common law was not only very restricted in scope, but also effectively unenforceable. After several years of discussions with the stakeholders, and especially with the government, um, the uh, 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 Surrey Archaeological Society found a notable um, champion, uh, the Earl of Perth, um, sorry, I've obscured the picture of him. Um, he features in, in this uh, press report here. Um, who was a great champion of treasure reform, um, even though he was aged well over 80 at the time um, that uh, this, this uh, was going on. Um, he had the energy of many people half his age. And he was, um, he was a great character, and he, he, he was able, because he had been a minister in Harold Macmillan's government, um, uh, although by the 1990s he was no longer a conservative on the conservative benches, he um, said, I, I, I think he was a cross bench, he said, I, I, sort of, um, I, can't, I can't remember how I ended up on the cross benches, but I, I had some disagreement with the conservatives. But he was able, he, was, uh, he, he had a lot of respect amongst um, the uh, uh, ministers at the time, and he was able to effectively to um, bully them into um, uh, uh, dropping their initial objections to the bill. Um, and um, in that debate that he secured in 1994, there were 11 speakers representing all the main parties, and all of them spoke in favor of the bill, except for the government um, spokesman. Um, but that was enough to change the government, to uh, persuade the government to change its mind, and it did agree to back it. Although uh, it took another two years, uh, until 1996, before um, that bill eventually passed through Parliament. The bill itself um, was a very modest reform, and it was introduced against a background of close scrutiny, not to say opposition, from three very different interest groups. Metal detector users, um, 
were one of those groups. And uh, one of their magazines, Treasure Hunting Magazine, led a campaign against the bill. And you might notice the rather catchy headline they came up with, Say No to Perth Control. Uh, and uh, uh, many individuals wrote to their MPs to persuade them um, to oppose the bill. Um, it's interesting, though, over the last 20 years, how things have turned around, because um, this same magazine is now actually paying for the publication of the annual reports of the Portable Antiquities Scheme. So there has been a change there. The second group um, who um, took a very close interest in this reform were landowners. And of course, at that time, we're talking about the House of Lords before its reform, uh, landowning interests were very um, dominant in the House of Lords, and they were concerned about um, anything that would lead to the extension of state ownership over objects that were otherwise their property. Of course, we're dealing with a different, we're in, in Scotland, we have a completely different regime. I know um, these objects would not have been the property of landowners in, in Scotland, but that is how it was in England and Wales. Um, and um, the government play, had paid quite close attention to landowners' views. There was another group as well who um, also had concerns, uh, archaeologists who argued for comprehensive portable antiquities legislation, arguing that all archaeological objects should belong to the state. Just um, to say a quick word about metal detecting, that is legal in England, Wales and Scotland, provided you have the permission of the landowner and you avoid scheduled archaeological sites. There are about some 18,000 in England. And metal detector users are uh, responsible for discovering about 95% of fines that um, classifies treasure under the Treasure Act and 85% of those reported to the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Um, by contrast, in most European countries, metal detecting is only allowed with a license, which is usually only granted if um, it takes place as part of an archaeological investigation. We think there's probably about 9,000 active metal detector users um, in England and Wales, so it isn't an enormous number. The Treasure Bill um, did, as I said, eventually pass through Parliament in 1996 and came into effect the following year um, uh, uh, following the passage of a second document, a code of practice which set out the detail of how it would work. And here are the main, its main points. It was not retrospective, so it only applied to objects found since September 1997. It brought in a new definition of treasure. Um, all objects other than coins um, that are at least 300 years old with at least 10% of gold or silver, or coins from the same find, provided they're at least 300 years old, and all objects found in association. There's a number of exclusions, um, so objects uh, belonging to the original uh, owner or heirs of the original owner, um, uh, unworked natural objects, and um, objects um, that might uh, fall under the uh, regime for wreck fines are uh, all excluded. It has effect in England, Wales and Northern Ireland and it contains a provision uh, for that uh, to be regular reviews and as a result of a review it is possible to um, alter, expand or in theory to contract the definition of what is treasure. The first review took place in 2002 and led to an extension to include prehistoric base metal deposits. Fines have to be reported to the coroner within 14 days of the finder realizing that the fine may be treasure and there's an offense of failing to report a find without a reasonable excuse and with a penalty of three months imprisonment or a £5,000 fine. But we are still awaiting the first prosecution under the Act. A key pillar of the system is the fact that finders and landowners receive the full market value of any treasure finds that museums wish to acquire. And giving finders the confidence that if they do the right thing and report their finds, and will, that, that they will be fairly rewarded, um, is one of a key to the success of the Treasure Act. Fines are valued by a committee of respected independent experts, currently chaired by um, Lord Renfrew, well-known archaeologist, and including representatives from 
the trade museums and metal detectorists. Um, archaeologists are not eligible for rewards um, and uh, the committee has the recommendation uh, the, the role of uh, recommending that rewards can be reduced or abated if there's evidence that the finder has um, failed to report all the circumstances of the find or maybe failed to report um, all, all the items in a find. And once a valuation has been agreed, museums have four months in which to raise the money. This slide shows the number of finds reported, first of all, under the own law of treasure trove from 1988 to 1997, so that's this line here, around 25 a year, and since 1997 um, here under the new Treasure Act. Um, in the first four years of the Act, um, the number of fines rose to about 200 uh, to 250 fines a year, but since the Portable Antiquity Scheme was uh, established across the whole country in 2002, you can see the numbers increased further, um, and um, <clears throat> to just under a thousand um, and it now the last couple of years it looks as though it might have begin uh, might have plateaued out at about that level um, of a thousand and the staff of the portable antiquities scheme clearly offer an essential role in the operation of the act 90 percent of all treasure cases are reported through them inevitably however not all fines are reported and illicit activity is a significant problem. Here's a case from um, over 30 years ago, it's a very important group of Romano British bronzes which uh, we had information being discovered by a metal detectorist um, at a site near Icklingham in Suffolk um, uh, and uh, were then um, spirited abroad and these turned up in a dealer's gallery in New York in the early 1990s. Uh, the uh, landowner tried very hard uh, to recover them, but the costs of launching a legal action in the United States were impossible for him. Um, and uh, they, they now <coughs> remain with a prominent um, American private collector who has said that she will leave them to the British Museum in her will, which I suppose is, slightly, is better than nothing, but um, it's uh, uh, not a very satisfactory example of um, of um, the operation, the protection given to um, antiquities um, that do, don't fall under the um, scope of the Treasure Act. Five years ago, English Heritage commissioned a survey of illegal metal detecting which provided some hard data on the extent of the problem and on two measures which could be compared with an earlier uh, survey carried out 14 years earlier, the numbers of scheduled monuments attacked and the numbers of archaeological units that reported raids on their excavations, it actually showed that um, the um, extent of illegal activity had declined. Um, this map shows um, where most cases of illegal activity are reported from. Uh, essentially, the eastern side of England, more or less coinciding with the areas that are richest for metal detecting. Um, the um, police response um, to reports of illegal metal detecting is variable, but um, certainly it, um, a few years ago was usually poor. Um, English Heritage have now appointed a police liaison officer who is having a considerable impact. Um, here's a case in which he was involved. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is the story of a prosecution from a couple of years ago concerning two detectorists who were caught on a scheduled site in Northamptonshire they uh, received fines um, and ASBOs. So um, there has been some progress, but there's more to be done. We also have a major concern about the number of antiquities being offered for sale on eBay. Uh, we've been monitoring that site for um, over seven years now uh, for unreported treasure fines. Um, and uh, we um, uh, logged uh, an average of about 1,500 British antiquities being offered for sale each month um, on eBay. And it seems to be one of the largest sources of antiquities for sale, but it's not subject to the same rules um, as dealers in antiquities are because <coughs> uh, eBay itself does not actually, is not responsible for handling the objects, it simply provides the website. So in order to address some of those concerns, 
<coughs> the Coroners and Justice Act 2009 contained a number of amendments to the Treasure Act. It provided for the establishment of <coughs> a single coroner to deal with reports of treasure from across England and Wales. And it extended the obligation to report treasure to anyone who knowingly comes into possession of it. Uh, and it also gave the government power to designate officers to whom treasure fines should be reported. Um, at the moment, the legislation says they should be reported to coroners, but in practice, <coughs> as I said, 97% of cases are reported to fines liaison officers. And clearly, it will be better to <coughs> bring the law into alignment with what actually happens. Unfortunately, though, the current government that came in in 2010 <clears throat> has so far decided not to implement those changes. But um, <clears throat> I think those uh, who are um, interested in the Treasure Act it remains a hope that um, these amendments which sit on the statute book might eventually be brought in. There's certainly a need for that to happen. However, another reform that we believe uh, will be taking place quite shortly is a second review of the Treasure Act Code of Practice. I said that one review had been held in 2002, um, and that led to the extension of the definition of treasure to prehistoric base metal hoards. Um, and um, there is now a dra draft of being considered of what the next review, which uh, we hope will be published this spring by the uh, government, might may contain. And one suggestion on the table at the moment, um, and we don't know whether the government will agree to it, is to extend um, the definition of treasure to all objects of national importance, perhaps using the Waverley criteria used for the export of works of art as, as a test. Um, so that uh, non-metal, uh, so that objects, whatever they are made of, if they are deemed to be of national importance, so it could include um, uh, ceramics, it could include stonework as well, could potentially be treasure. Um, we are remaining uh, waiting to see what government lawyers, uh, again, have to say on that point. In support of the Treasure Act, um, is we have the Portable Antiquities Scheme, which is a network of locally based archaeologists, finds liaison officers, who encourage members of the public, especially metal detector users, to report all finds of archaeological importance, which we define as objects more than 300 years old. Um, this started with a number of pilot schemes in 1997, and six years later, it was extended across the whole of England and Wales. <clears throat> and this map shows where the posts are based. There are 39 fines liaison officers, fine, five fines advisors who provide specialist advice on fines, um, and four other staff. And um, this um, scheme is now administered by the British Museum with funding from the government. Our staff are able to record these fines uh, by proactively going out and encouraging them to report. So uh, they will go to metal detecting club meetings and they might organize fines events where people are encouraged to bring any fines in for recording. And this sort of work can lead fines liaison officers into other areas as well. Um, here's a case where our fines liaison officer in Cumbria was holding a fines day in the museum at Maryport when a member of the public brought in an intact Roman pot. On further inquiry, it turned out that such objects were regularly found on the beach at Beckford after major storms, as there's a Roman cemetery that is actually um, on the edge of the cliff and gradually falling into the sea. So far, six Roman cremations with associated grave assemblages of beakers, flagons, metalwork, and glass have been recorded. And Faisi officer has been trying to persuade the responsible authority, English Heritage, to carry out a rescue excavation on this site. Hence this story in British archaeology to try and um, move them into action. This shows the number of objects recorded on the Portable Antiquity Schemes database since 1998. Um, and we are now seeing about 80,000 objects a year. We believe that this is at the limit of what our current um, team can record. 
And in fact, they're now having to find ways of limiting the fines that they're offered for recording. Because uh, we cannot, can't expect um, additional funding to enable us to expand our network, we're looking at other ways of increasing capacity, particularly by encouraging volunteers, um, finders and others, to record fines. And we have some hundred volunteers who are currently recording um, on our database. Later this year, we hope with lottery funding to introduce three new posts to um, expand to boost our volunteer efforts. This is the home page of the online database, which now has records of 925,000 um, objects from across England and Wales. And this is the map that shows um, where these objects have come from. And as you can see, they come from all across the country, um, except for the mountainous um, and thinly populated areas, such as the, the Pennines, the, the mountains of Wales, or the moorlands of the southwest. And here's an example of a, of a record. Um, this obviously is not a metal detected find, but a, a lithic uh, implement found um, by, by a field walker. <clears throat> now um, I'd like to um, look at the use um, of the data that we've been recording. In April 2010, metal detector user Dave Crisp, who we see over here, discovered a pot containing 52,500 Roman coins while detecting on farmland near Foom in Somerset. The archaeological record um, contained no information about Roman activity on this field, although uh, Mr. Crisp had found a stray coin of Hadrian and some sherds of Roman pottery. Um, this is the uh, fine spot of the hall just about there. His first discovery uh, was not this the large pot of coins, but a scattered group of um, around 100 um, late 4th century silver coins known as siliquai, a type of ore quite common in Britain, but much rarer elsewhere. Subsequent re research revealed that a hoard of 111 coins of the same type had been discovered on the same farm in 1867, so perhaps this was another portion of that hoard. A little while later, while searching on the same field, he received another response about 100 metres from the fine spot of the uh, 4th century silver coins. Digging down, he uncovered the top of a large pot that turned out to be full of coins. At that point, crucially, he stopped and contacted his, his local fines liaison officer, who was able to arrange the archaeological excavation of the hoard, which, is, which we see here. That's the pot full to the brim with coins, and this is the local archaeologist, Alan Graham, gradually uncovering it. Um, Mr. Crisp and the farmer and his family were also involved in the ex excavation. Because of the size of the pot and the weight of the coins, um, they weighed, um, we subsequently discovered, 160 kilograms. Um, the pot had to be dismantled in situ, and the coins were removed carefully, layer by layer, in over 80 context bags. And there were um, 52,503 coins, making it the second largest hoard ever to be discovered uh, in Britain. Coins were almost all um, the same denomination, uh, radiates of very base silver dating between about 250 and 290 AD, including five very fine silver denarii of this man Carausius, who was emperor in Britain around 290 AD. And these are the latest coins in the hoard. The excavation gave us vital evidence about how the hoard was buried. The first point that became obvious is that the pot, which was which is quite thin, could never have borne the 160 kilograms of coins. It would have immediately collapsed under the weight of them. So the pot must have been placed in the ground empty and then the coins added to it. Because the coins were carefully recovered in a series of 10 layers or spits, that's this diagram here, <clears throat> we know that most of the coins of Carausius, the latest ones in the hoard, were actually uh, buried more than halfway down the pot. And this diagram shows where those coins were. You can see the biggest group, 650 of them, was down here, uh, a long way down the pot, which means that the coins must have been placed in the pot on a single occasion. 
All this has called into question the traditional interpretation of hoarding. If the original owners of this hoard had intended to come back and recover it later, then surely they would have buried their coins in smaller containers which would have been easier to recover. The only way anyone could have recovered this hoard would have been by breaking the pot and scooping the coins out of it. In addition, um, there is also the fact that we have another hoard of coins just about 100 years later um, buried in the same field, uh, which made us wonder, could this have been a sacred field? So could we be looking at possibly ritual deposition uh, as an explanation rather than uh, burial with intention of recovery? Um, another question is why are there so many hoards of this period in Britain? This chart um, shows a, a summary by date of burial of just under 5,000 coin hoards from Britain. And you can see that the greatest peak of them is at this period, the end of the 3rd century AD. This peak here is from the 1640s, um, the um, decade of the English Civil War. In order to understand better the reasons for hoarding in the Iron Age and Roman periods, we made a bid to the Arts and Humanities Research Council for a uh, project on hoarding in Iron Age and Roman Britain. And that started um, last summer. Its um, aim is to understand why so many hoards were buried in Iron Age and Roman Britain with a particular focus on studying their contexts. Um, and this um, uh, study of context has been traditionally neglected in England because of the sheer volume of finds that have been coming out of the ground. Um, so this is a three-year project um, uh, funded by the HRC and it's a partnership between uh, the British Museum and the University of Leicester and we have three research assistants uh, who uh, will be compiling a database of all um, Iron Age and Roman hordes one will be carrying out a um, GIS, that's Geographical Information System based survey of fine spots and a geophysical survey of selected hordes, while a third to be appointed this spring will be studying theories of deposition of metalwork. And we already have some very interesting results, which um, is that uh, from a couple of uh, counties which have been analyzed so far, the majority of uh, hordes are not being found where you might think in, um, in, 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 in valleys or places where you could conceal them, but actually either on the summits or the slopes of hills, which is really quite a, a surprising finding. 60% of the hordes from Somerset and 80% of the hordes from Yorkshire that um, applies to. Um, <clears throat> since um, 2006, um, we've had we've also benefited from a program, another program funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council for uh, uh, collaborative doctoral awards, which are funded PhDs, uh, uh, a collaboration between um, museums and um, uh, universities. Um, and I won't run through all these, but um, we uh, eight of these so far have been focusing on the data that has come through um, the Portable Antiquities Scheme. <clears throat> we have two more starting in October, one of which will uh, provide a direct um, uh, addition to the Hordes project by bringing in Iron Age metalwork hordes into the scope of that project. Um, but this slide is um, uh, from one of those PhDs, um, a study by uh, Tom Brindle, who's a former fines liaison officer, who researched how um, the data recorded by Portable Antiquities Scheme added to our knowledge of the Roman um, uh, rural background, a Roman rural settlement of Britain. He focused on six areas, including Worcestershire and Warwickshire in the West Midlands. Um, and his work showed that the PAS data revealed 76 assemblages of fines that he suggested could be regarded as representing new sites not previously known. Um, and he defined those as five or more finds within 200 meters of each other. Uh, <clears throat> this um, increased the number of known settlements on the uh, uh, National Monuments Program from those counties by 30%, which is um, a, a really significant addition, I think, to our knowledge of the archaeological landscape. Um, and the third project um, I'll just mention briefly um, has re received funding from the Leverhulme Trust. Um, this is um, uh, employing one 
uh, research um, assistant, Dr. Catherine Robbins, for three years to undertake a study of the factors underlying the re fines recorded by portable antiquities. And one of the main outcomes will be to provide an online tool for researchers to use when uh, they want to interpret um, distributions of fines recorded by the scheme. Uh, so this gives you an example um, of, of the type of work she's been doing. Taking the Isle of Wight as an example, the map on the left shows the distribution of fines recorded by the scheme with um, those in red representing the greatest density, followed by those in green and then those in yellow. Um, and um, this uh, map here shows those areas uh, which are off limits uh, to metal detecting. Um, uh, National Trust land, forestry land, and sites of um, science, special scientific interest. So if you can put the um, she's uh, what we call a restraints map against the actual distribution of fines, then you can start to um, really inter try and interpret the data in more detail. And um, this, uh, this puts the, uh, all the uh, land which is not available for metal detecting is shaded gray here, and the PS fines are the dots in blue. And this um, immediately raises the issue as to what to investigate these areas here. Um, and also here as to why, and down here perhaps as well, as to why there are so few fines recorded by the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Here's a more, much more detailed look at one location on the um, south coast of the island. Um, here you can see how the PS finds the blue dots here are clustering um, around the boundaries of a village. That's um, marked here in, in grey, um, around... Um, a S, um, an SSI site that's down here and National Trust land over here. So to conclude, what lessons have we learnt in England and Wales that might be relevant here? Obviously the greatest difference between the two regimes is that in England and Wales only a limited class of objects have statutory protection and are legally required to be reported. However, it's clear that introducing legislation isn't enough on its own. For the first five years of the Treasure Act, only about 200 cases a year were being reported. An increase on the 25 a year under the um, old law of treasure trove, but reporting only really took off in 2003 when a national network of fines and and officers was established. And of course, those same staff are now recording some 80,000 objects a year in addition, which are being reported voluntarily. So our experience is that a network of dedicated staff who are focused on the recording of fines made by amateurs is essential if one is to fully unlock the enormous potential in this data set. Thank you very much.